Hey everyone, welcome to the Note Investor Podcast. I'm Dan Deppin, and today I'm joined by Axel Meyerhofer. So, Axel, how you doing? Good. How are you, Dan? Good, good. Well, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, I was interested in talking to you about uh, some of your background, which I think is kind of unique coming to real estate and then how you do investing from out of state. So so maybe we can just start by talking a little bit about you know your Air Force career and some of the things you did before you got into real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the Air Force. I was uh, originally out of school pretty much straight out of school, joined the Air Force to learn how to fly, did all of that, did my flight training in the US and so forth. And then uh, as I was getting into the career, I got the opportunity to join the flight test team. And all those little black boxes uh, typically are made by some American company somewhere. And most of them were actually made by California Silicon Valley companies. So Mm -hmm. my wife and I had the opportunity to come to the U.S. a bunch of times for like three to six weeks for training. I I did training Um, and we were like thinking, hmm, would there be maybe an opportunity to come for a longer stay? And I explored that a little bit. And out of it, I discovered that there is actually an exchange program between the U.S. Air Force and the German Air Force. And so then I came over mid 90s. Uh, originally planned to be two to three years and it became six years and then my flying career came to an end and so we ended up retiring in the U.S. got recruited into a software company in Santa Barbara so now we were in California and really liked it. (laughs) Yeah that's a cool location I haven't actually been to Santa Barbara but I've heard it's pretty amazing. I highly recommend it bring bring a few extra bucks and it's a really nice place to go. Yeah, not cheap. Nothing's cheap there, probably especially there. Right, exactly. Yeah, but it's worth it. And so, yeah, so I was working there, living there. Our daughter finished high school there and went to school there in, in um, what's it called, in a community college uh, to get ready to um, transition into the um, California university system because they had a um, program where if you finish the local community college, you had basically a right for transfer if you mm-hmm. meet the GP. And that was important to us um, because we wanted her to go to a good school. Yeah, so all those things. But one thing that became clear is um, the job was really not nothing for the long term. And I decided to start my own business. But that also meant we have to come up with some way of additional long term support or some kind of retirement income. Otherwise, we would have to work forever, especially you have to keep in mind at the time, Santa Barbara being such an expensive area that we thought wow we really have to do something to be ever able to retire not necessarily thinking it has to be in santa barbara but you wouldn't know right and so Mm -hmm. started looking around and that was basically early 2000s when we had just recently had the dot-com bust and so i was looking what else can you do if you don't want to have that same thing happening like many people suffered from the stock market and real estate was pretty much the thing that i found and started studying and got into it more and more and yeah and ultimately turned it into a business cool so so what did you fly in the air force um i started out in germany initially with a french made plane called the alpha jet and then i trained on and this test flight team was for a plane called the gr1 tornado and then when i came over here to the to the u.s air force i flew f-111s for them and uh yeah so those were the three main planes that I flew in that career. No, oh, that, that, that's super cool. So what was the dot-com blow up like in California at the time? Like, I remember that area from just, you know, ha- having gotten pretty deep into stocks in the nineties and having no idea that things could blow up like that. Like my uh, worst investment I've ever made, I actually bought a dot-com mutual fund that I think I ultimately lost like 98% or something ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, well, in my case, what had happened is um, towards the end of my military career, I guess we lost, in a sense, the immunity to this constant drumbeat of, you know, the economy will forever grow, the stock market will forever go up, the new technology and the internet will be the future, and we don't have to worry about fluctuations as much anymore. And we thought, well, okay, this sounds pretty interesting. And at the time when these dot-com companies started, 
they were all super cheap. They were like basically penny stocks, if you think about it, right? And so mm -hmm. we said, well, maybe we dabble a little bit and we kind of research a little bit. It's perfectly good education to learn a little bit about how stock investing works. And we started with really, really tiny amounts and in the late 90s. And we actually had, like everybody, on paper, really, really great success. But like you just said, <laughs> it was just on paper. And in this particular case, I have to say, now this is with hindsight, like what is it, almost 25 years now, 22 years. Um, for one, we never learned how to take profits, which we should have, because we could have made at least double or triple of what we had originally invested, but we never took it out. Mm -hmm. The other thing was I had not really studied finance investing in, in any level very much. And so I had no concept how something can go gradually up, even if the jumps or the steps are pretty big steps, but a, a continuous upward trend. And then within, I think with the bubble burst took like three months mm -hmm. to basically go from like the peak to like way below the, the lowest level years before in three months. And that was something that I just didn't have anticipated. So it was in my, and I'm not saying this as a defense, but it was hard to distinguish between a little downturn or a crash right yeah so when, it, it, it was, in hindsight it's obvious but when you're in yeah, the yeah, middle in of it, it you don't obvious, know right but, because even in those up cycles it takes little down cycles in the middle of yeah, that. every once yeah. in a while there was like a five or eight percent dip and then it just recovered and went on and those dips took anywhere between a couple of weeks to maybe a month right and so i remember i think from the peak the first dip went down about 12% within a month. And my little crew of, of fellow small scale investors and I, we were all convinced, okay, that's just the typical thing has happened dozens of times before. And we were literally waiting that it turns around and keeps, you know, stabilizing, going up again. And while we were waiting in that next two, three weeks period, it lost another 10%. Right. And mm -hmm. so you're saying, OK, this is a little unusual. And then it finally like totally crashed in the next couple of weeks. So within like less than three months, like you said, like 90 something percent was gone. Mm -hmm. And we were also not smart enough in hindsight to start at the very bottom. We came in when it had already gone up like 30 or 40 percent. So, you know, to go below what we had originally paid didn't take all the way from the bottom to a new bottom. Anyways, it was on paper a lot of money, even though our initial investment was very moderate. But what it taught me is not so much this exact episode. What it taught me is you really need to know your stuff. Mm -hmm. right? And so for one, I couldn't consciously say, OK, I want to try again. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you hacked off a foot and then you say, okay, let's see if I can be a runner again, right? Like that's- Yeah, touched, <laughs> maybe... touched a hot stove, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, exactly, any of those analogies, yeah. So I was literally saying, okay, what else can we do, right? And what else do other people do? And one thing I've often told that little anecdote is I started to look at what do people whose name I know actually do with their money. And one of the ones that was really big time in the news was Arnold Schwarzenegger with the, mm -hmm. um, with the Terminator movies. And I'm like, okay, so this guy is from Austria. I'm from Germany. He is in the US, super successful, but he wasn't always rich. I wonder what he's doing with his money. And so I started looking into it. And even during his bodybuilding career, he had already started investing in real estate in California. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay. So a guy that everybody accuses not being that smart. And, you know, when he did Conan the Barbarian, they made him deliberately stumble around his words as if he couldn't speak a straight sentence and nobody thought he would ever become a governor or whatever, right? And so, mm -hmm. but for me, that was inspiring, like a kind of quote unquote fellow immigrant. And he discovered with help, he had advisors, obviously, that real estate was, especially residential real estate was a good idea. And so I started studying it. And I remember I bought like CDs and tapes and stuff and books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people don't realize that like in the 70s, like I think he was buying apartment buildings and yeah. things like that because there was no money in bodybuilding. At yeah, least it's at also, the time. I mean, he had, he had a, um, 
protege, uh, he, he was a protege of, of a magazine uh, publisher. Mm -hmm. And that gave him access to some information. It's actually really well uh, described in his memoir. I, I thought it was a really nice book. I'm not sure if he really wrote it himself or had a ghostwriter, but it's like really go taking you on the journey of his life. And yeah, and whenever he had some money and he, he realized that he doesn't need it for consumption, he looked to put it somewhere. But he was also smart enough to say, what is a good thing? And people put, pointed him towards real estate, you know, and... Now, the other thing is also, you know, the war history and his whole family history. If you read into this a little bit, it makes sense that, you know, from what sustained and I coming from Germany knew this too. The people in Germany after World War II that were back on their feet the quickest were either previous owners of businesses that somehow basically knew, okay, if I get the opportunity, I can rebuild my business or previous owners of real estate, even if it was destroyed, they still owned the land, they still had a way to get a loan on the land to rebuild. And they were when Germany was pretty much all destroyed very early on, the first people who were able to actually make money by providing like, for example, shelter, meaning like, you know, apartments and stuff. Yeah. And the government was highly interested to rebuild everything. So anybody who had a real estate background, was highly appreciated, right? So those either industrialists or real estate owners uh, or landowners were the, the two categories that got back on their feet the quickest. I just had the misconception that I have, have found over the years still persisting in the US to a large degree is that you already have to have a whole bunch either in money or assets to get going. And I learned with my own story coming from extremely humble background that that's really not true. You can be a, just a regular person who either finds a mentor, which I highly recommend because it accelerates the path, or you study it all yourself and start small and learn about it and then work your way in. You know. Right. So so what was your first foray into real estate? Um, well, one of the, well, it depends a little bit on how you look at it. One of the kind of funny side stories was I mentioned this exchange program and so the story has a little bit of an extension to it. I applied for this exchange job and there's only like one or two per year that actually gets selected. Mm -hmm. And there were obviously way more applicants than jobs. So I applied and um, after about a month or so, I got we, the applicants in my unit, we were all asked to the commander's office and he said, okay, not you, not you, not you, but this guy. When I wasn't one of the ones. <laughs> That mm -hmm. was the one that was selected. And we were, my wife and I were in the process of um, thinking, should we renovate the house that we had just bought or just leave it as it is? And so we didn't really want to commit to anything before we knew the decision. Then we got told, or I got told, okay, it's not you. So then we said, okay, well, if we're not going, then we might as well make the house nice and started renovating it. And a couple of months later, I get asked to come to the commander's office and he says, well, there were some issues with the guy that we chose and the, the next best choice, you know, you kind of like the second best choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you, you can have the exchange if you want to, if you still want to go, but I need to know quickly. So I literally left the office. I'm like, wow, this is crazy, right? I called my wife and say, can you believe it? They just told me we can go if we want to. Do you want to go? And she said immediately, almost immediately. Yeah, absolutely. And so... We had a house freshly renovated and we we're like okay is there any way we can sell it and we thought no let's try to rent it big mistake no experience mm -hmm. <laughs> and no no property management and being six thousand miles away so we ultimately had to sell it because it was just impossible to have tenants in it that was kind of like the first one and then mm -hmm. the second one um, many years later was we were stationed at my last assignment place and the government had announced that they were bringing in a bunch of people and going to pay them the rent. And in our neighborhood, there was a house for sale. And we thought, wow, this is kind of cool. We can buy the house and get the government to pay the rent and they mm -hmm. pay better than most people would. So no risk, let's buy that house. And we did. And the little anecdote, I mean, we never lost any money. We actually made a little money on that house, but the idea from an investing perspective was to make some additional income but we had a, fellow, a, a Air Force officer tenant with his family 
who claimed that he had never heard that you need to open the air chute when you make a fire in the fireplace. So oh, wow. Ru ruined the whole living room, dining room, kitchen area because he made a fire and let the chute be closed until the fire alarms went off, you know, and so that was basically our cash flow going up in smoke. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> So what was it like in that first experience trying to do it, you know, from 6,000 miles away and such a, such a distance? Um, I, I would actually say, you know, when you don't know what you don't know, on the one hand, you make all the mistakes that you could make, but you don't really know that they are mistakes either. It was just blissful ignorance, I would call it probably. Right? Like we thought, mm -hmm. oh, how hard can it be? Somebody And see, one other thing I have to say as well is there is a tendency that if you are a person who, when getting access in some way, shape or form, or borrow something from somewhere else, like me, if I borrow something, I take care of it as if it were mine. Mm -hmm. Right. Or whenever we were tenants in a property, we looked after it as if it was ours. Now, one thing that that triggers is, in my opinion, that you somehow right or wrong, and in most cases wrong, have the expectations that everybody is like that. Right. So we thought, OK, well, if we were the tenants, we would take care of it. It had a nice garden and uh, it had freshly renovated. Everything was pristine. And obviously, we, we had agreed to a reasonable rent. Well, that tenant was not like us. He didn't look at it like his own. He didn't look after it. He constantly had something that was broken where you could ask, was it really broken by itself or did he break it? Didn't take mm -hmm. care of the landscaping, all kinds of issues all the time. Right? And so when I say blissful ignorance is we just couldn't imagine that people would be that ignorant in as far or that you know, dismissive of other people's property. You know, now I've learned and still do today, you know, but I have no expectations anymore because I know better. But at the time I thought, okay, nice house, nice neighborhood, right close to his work. He was a small business owner. I just couldn't imagine that he would treat it that way. Right. So, so now then how did it go once you um, got past some of the early learning curves and got more proficient and got going? Well, one of the things I mentioned that we got uh, out of the military into the Santa Barbara area, and it was very obvious, it was a big, big struggle for us ourselves to find a place to live. Right? We initially rented and then ultimately found a house, but it, any, any intention to invest, even though I used this example with Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I mean, we had obviously not anywhere near the kinds of monies that he was making, even with just one movie, right? Or mm -hmm. with a in bodybuilding so if you sit down even at the time and you ran the numbers there was no way that there could be any kind of cash flowing investment but i was in a sense lucky because i through my studies i came a, a, across a book by a guy named chris closure uh, titled the turnkey revolution mm -hmm. and i read that book and i was like wow that's the solution Right, that's really the way to go. Now, he didn't write it to include that aspect that I added to it being out of state, but he was basically describing how can you be an investor as if you run a business fully outsourced. You outsource any kind of renovation work, you outsource the maintenance, you outsource the tenant uh, finding, you outsource the rent collection, you outsource the property management, everything is outsourced. And if mm -hmm. you do that, then it can almost be anywhere, right? So I read that book and I said, okay, here is all this advice on how to deal from an investor's perspective with a turnkey provider. I don't see why that turnkey provider couldn't be a thousand or 2000 miles away from where you live, right? And suddenly those places that were always known to perform better from a cash flow perspective, like the Midwest or like the Idaho's and Illinois of the world or the Tennessee's and, and stuff like that, they suddenly were in play. Now the trick was only finding turnkey providers that were actually operating the way the book was describing, which were not very many. Right. I mean, it sounds kind of like the Tim Ferriss four hour work week concept just applied to real estate instead of some of the other businesses he was talking about in that book. Right. Yeah. In, in a sense, it has some similarities. Um, 
conceptually to say, you know, everything that needs to be done can be done by somebody that you pay a fee for, or, you know, provides it as a service. So yeah, in that sense, you're right. Um, the other aspect is obviously, you know, if you run a business and you outsource everything, then the worst thing that can happen is that the performance of the business is not so great, but there's still a liability aspect with real estate because you have pretty expensive items. You know, if you look at a house as mm -hmm. an item, you know, like anywhere, when we first started, you were still able to get houses below a hundred thousand. Now everything is like 150, 180, 250, stuff like that. And that adds up pretty quickly. And just the activity of property management or turnkey um, services is one thing, but as the owner, right, there is still a huge value asset in, in a sense attached to that versus, you know, like any kind of service provider, online business or something like that. Right. So, so did you start by doing rentals actually in Santa Barbara or were you going outside oh, the area? We, we could oh. have never done that. And so, well, that's not quite true. One thing that happened is I had started after my job in the, in the software industry, I had started a consulting company and my wife and I realized it's kind of weird. All our clients and all our contracts are for some strange reason on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So I was constantly getting on a plane in Santa Barbara, fly to LA, fly from LA to Philadelphia or to New York or to Washington DC or stuff, spend the week and then come back late, late, Friday and having to leave basically Sunday night again. Mm -hmm. And we were like, there must be a better way to make this happen. And we looked on the map and thought, okay, what places do we like that still have a nice climate that would get us closer to the East Coast? And we ended up landing on Santa Fe, New Mexico, partly mm -hmm. also because I was stationed in New Mexico for six years. So we've been there quite a few times. It wasn't completely new to us. So is that like in Albuquerque? The, uh, no, well, yeah, it's Albuquerque is about 60 miles from Santa Fe. So, yeah. And, and yeah, but flying in and out of Albuquerque was basically the solution and or the idea. So then we said, okay, well, here is the house in Santa Barbara. Um, but at the time we had the, um, it was 2011 and the area had not yet recovered from the um, financial crisis. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we had sold it, we would have just about got the money back that we paid for it. And I just think, thought that wasn't a good deal. So we ended up renting that house just to break even and then buy a house in Santa Fe. Right? It was mm -hmm. not for cash flow. It was not really seen so much as an investment property. It was more like the longer we wait, the more this thing is going to be worth in the future. And if you think about it, we... Um, we moved to Santa Fe in 2011, and then we ended up selling that house in 2018. So in those seven years, it went from about 575 value to 900. Right? So, <laughs> so it was good to wait, even though we didn't make any positive cash flow in the time. Um, right. Yeah, and then the funny thing, just to finish that story for your audience, was that so we moved to Santa Fe, get settled, get in. I'm doing the first few flights to the East Coast. And then that group of clients almost within a month or two all decided, well, you know, we really don't want to pay this travel cost. It's really expensive to bring you here all the time. And the project is pretty much done. Um, we kind of think we want to let it run to the end of the contract, but we're not expecting to renew. So I go back to my marketing team and say, okay, well, what kind of new projects can you find in the next few months so we don't fall into a hole? They say, oh, good that you're asking. We have a project in San Francisco. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> so, right? so we're moving from Santa, Santa Barbara to Santa Fe to be closer to the East Coast. And within a few months, all work was in San Francisco, which would have been so convenient from Santa Barbara, right? Like, so, mm -hmm. well, so for a while, I flew Santa Fe, San Francisco. <laughs> well, you still had your house, so I guess you could potentially get back in, yeah. Yeah, on, on, on paper, that sounds like it. But, you know, if you really look at it, you, you give somebody a one-year lease agreement, you can't just evict them out just because your personal circumstances right. again and stuff like that, right? And again, it comes to your own principles, right? You don't, at least I've always lived by the principle, I don't want to be an asshole even by my own judgment, regardless of what other people say, you know? So, right. 
So yeah, we we did that, but we realized okay, the Santa Fe thing was okay, but it was for that purpose of being closer to the East Coast. And after a few years, we said okay, you know, we really liked it better in in California, and ended up moving back to San Diego actually, you know, and so okay. And by that time, the house had gained so much in value that we sold it in 1031, exchanged it into a bunch of properties in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. And then those Midwest properties became your new rentals. Yeah, exactly. And by then, I had already done so much research that I knew the good full service turnkey providers. Okay, very cool. So and then how, how does one find like a good turnkey service provider because i know like a lot of people in the audience live in high cost of living states yeah. not like the colorado where i am and so that that kind of thing is appealing well the quickest way is to just contact me and i make mine available to you um, mm -hmm. if you want to go on your own search you can basically go on google and and find turnkey providers within either a state or a region or stuff like that the biggest thing that I can say for your audience, and I say this also for anybody who is approaching me for a complimentary call or something is, what I consider a full service turnkey provider is an organization that finds what I call the ugly duckling in a good neighborhood or does new construction, then puts up the property when it's finished, ready for appraisal. That's really an important component, right? Sometimes people say, yeah, okay, they put it up for sale but they need to really put it up for appraisal because that means it's need, it needs to be able to stand up to be a comparative appraisal with other properties in the, in the vicinity, mm -hmm. right? Meaning like if, if you have a four bedroom, two bath house that is just freshly renovated in a nice neighborhood that used to be the ugly duckling and they put it up for 180, but every house that is similar in the area is 150, the appraiser won't give you 180. Right. right. And, and you can change the number to 283. It doesn't matter. It's the principle. So the turnkey provider needs to manage how much did they buy it for and how much did they renovate it for. So when they put it up for, for sale, it, it needs to appraise because as an investor, we don't want to pay more than the appraised value because that's also what our financing is based on. Mm -hmm. Right. So find it, renovate it, put it up for appraisal. So then let's say you and I were working together on one and we buy it, put it under contract, we buy it then. And lately I'm pushing them also, and, and they are willing to do it to try to find a tenant while we are in this process of going through getting the financing arranged in those like 30 to 45 days. Mm -hmm. So they find a tenant and then we basically close the deal regular, you know, like financing is done, closing is done. So now they also the same organization is providing the property management. And so the full service is they have a renovation and construction department, they have a marketing and sales department, and they have a property management department and all under one roof. Those are pretty rare, but they exist. Gotcha. And then typically, and, and I ask this because people always ask me this about notes is like, like what, what kind of capital does it take to get started typically and do the first one? I'm sure mileage varies, but yeah, right now, I would say in those locations that we predominantly invest right now, and Ohio is probably our most favorite right now, different places in Ohio, but in general in that state, although there mm -hmm. are also, Tennessee is, is still pretty good and some other states in the Midwest, but you should assume something in the area of about 30,000 to start. Okay, and, and that's not too bad. And, and can people do that like at a self-directed IRAs as well? Yeah, you can, it, I mean, but you, you can... Well, you can do it self-directed IRAs. You can do it uh, in a um, self-directed brokerage account for your 401k if your el employer allows that. Um, you can do it by selling any other assets that you might have uh, to make the down payment. So that's basically the down payment component on a $150,000 house. And in the locations that we are investing, um, we still get those between, you know, I have one for 145 right now we have one for 180 that's a duplex and makes 2000 rent a month you know so those are pretty good deals in reasonably good uh, neighborhoods right makes sense so well very cool well axel thanks for telling us your story i really appreciate it any any parting thoughts for the audience or the advice for people getting started 
Yeah, well, one thing, and um, I mean, you touched on it when we first started, that I always like to point out, when you take this approach, and like I said, I'm inviting anybody who's listening and said, hey, this sounds interesting, just contact me and, and we talk about it and see if I can help you, because that absolutely accelerates the whole process. But um, what's important is when you really work like we do and I do for my own portfolio with these full service turnkey providers, what you end up doing at the end of the month, and it doesn't matter whether you have one property or five properties with them, is you schedule a call every month to talk to them. So in my case, I have two clusters because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So I have an Ohio cluster and an Idaho, Illinois cluster, two turnkey providers, and I talk to each of them for about 30 minutes each month. So a total mm -hmm. of one hour that I'm basically checking into my full service providers. And all the rest, as we just discussed, all the rest of the work, whether they are working on something new and say, hey, are you interested? Here's our next property. And I can take it or leave it. Or if something comes up, you know, they sent me a pretty sophisticated report about everything with every property, any kind of maintenance issue, blah, blah, blah. And then I spent, like I said, 30 minutes to talk to them once a month. So my real work, unless I want to do more for the maintenance of my portfolio is one hour a month. And most people think it, it takes like all kinds of effort and time. And that's a myth that I would love to be able to dispel. That sounds good. So, so how can people, I'll put the, all the links and everything in the notes, but how can people reach you if they want to learn more? Yeah, the easiest is uh, to go to idealwealthgrower.com. That's our website. And if you look at the top right-hand corner, there's a little button that says book a call or complimentary call or discovery call, or they constantly change the name of the button, but something yeah. that says call and you just click on it and you get directly on my calendar and you can book a time. And I always like to get to learn and to know people because if we work together, I can tell you one thing and I'm very proud of that. We are not a very big you know, hundreds of people kind of company. We're more like a boutique shop. But those who have decided to work with us, nobody has ever left. And the mm -hmm. reason I believe is because we really build a relationship that is initially to find properties and get the financing and all that kind of investing stuff. But then it also goes to how do we protect your family? How can I help you to build a legacy? How can I maybe coach you to overcome some communication issues where you're always afraid to speak to authority and stuff. So it becomes a much more holistic relationship. And I'm sure this is partially true to you with your clients too. It's not just showing them how to buy and sell notes, but it becomes, I call them a tribe or you could also call them like extended family or something like that. Right? And they're still all with us. Doesn't mean that we talk with each other like every week or every month, but if anybody ever needs something after they went through the initial period of getting into the investments and learning from me and getting access to all my relationships and, and service providers, they always stick around. Nobody has said, hey, I don't need this anymore. And I think that's actually the thing I'm most proud of. That's awesome. Well, thanks again for joining and we'll see you guys next time. Yeah, thanks, Dan, for having me. All right. Oops.